one of the world's largest alternative asset managers, Brookfield Asset Management, just reported their third quarter earnings for 2023, and they were great. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to be looking at their earnings on a high level. We'll be looking at some specific financial metrics, and then we will finally be finishing off by looking at some specific sections of a letter from their CEO, Bruce Flatt. So if that's some content you would be interested in listening to, I encourage you to watch the video. And if you like it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. So without further ado, let's go and dive right in. So their third quarter earnings here, again, we're going to be looking at their earnings growth, the capital that they raised here, and what dry powder or cash that they have available for investments. So these are the highlights here on a high level. So $565 million in fee-related earnings or FRE. And that basically resulted into 568 million of distributable earnings or DE. So this was basically a little more than 100%, but we'll look at the breakdown of that because Brookfield Asset Management here, as we know, distributes all of its earnings out to its shareholders or roughly 90%. Now, 57% on the last 12 months of a fee-related earnings margin. So a nice margin here of fee-related earnings. Now let's look at the capital that they raised throughout this year. So they raised about $61 billion year to date. So it's a lot of money in terms of bringing on capital to be invested and earn fees on as well as distributable earnings. Now their fee bearing capital roughly in line with the previous quarter, 440 billion. So it's pretty much flat from the previous quarter. And they're saying they're going to have a record capital raising expected in 2023. So roughly $150 billion in total. Now, when we look at their substantial dry powder and investment activity, so they have $102 billion of uncalled fund commitments. So what this means is they roughly have $102 billion here sitting on the sidelines that have been uncalled for that they are going to then invest and then in turn earn additional fees on this money. So that's why they call it dry powder. It's sitting there just waiting to be invested. They've put out about 65 billion in the last 12 months in deployment and then 35 billion plus in the last 12 months in gross monetizations so let's go and look at their earnings so this is their third quarter financial performance and at the top as we can see here the fee related earnings or fre was about 565 million like we saw which is about 35 cents a share and up eight percent from the prior year period for that same quarter and again the distributable earnings here or de just in line with that same at 568 million, the same at 35 cents a share, and up that same percentage at 8%. So this is the most recent quarter that they're reporting on boxed in, and this is the previous quarter for the previous year. And then here's the last 12 months here as well for your reference. So the total fee revenues right here were 1.1 billion, and then they had direct costs of 511 million, resulting in that nice 598 FRE or fee related earnings and then you have to adjust for the amounts not attributable to BAM that gives you that 565 million dollars of BAM fee related earnings and a nice FRE margin here at 56 percent so those fee related earnings again you have to adjust for equity based compensation and then any cash taxes and that's how you get a little bit higher here of a distributable earnings. So that fee-related earnings as a percentage of distributable earnings, it's basically 100%. So this resulted to $0.35 cents per share of FRE and DE. Now again, if you're unfamiliar with these terms, I encourage you to go and watch the previous videos I've made on Brookfield, the Brookfield ecosystem, Brookfield Asset Management, their various subsidiaries. They're all over my channel, and I'll leave links to those in the description below. So that was their earnings. And again, you can look at them on the last 12 months basis as well. But nice steady growth here up 8%. So let's look at that fee related earnings or FRE in detail. Like we saw, it was just basically one flat number of the revenues. But let's go ahead and look at each of those subsidiaries or those specific classes of their business that earn those fees in detail. So we can see renewable power and transition. It was actually down from the previous quarter in the previous year. So that, again, 116 million compared to the 120 previously. And when you look at the last 12 months, it is up slightly, but basically flat here. Their infrastructure business is still humming along nicely, up for, to 243 million from the previous 210 million in the prior quarter last year. 
Private equity, again, up to 125 million from 117. Real estate, 244 million up from 235 million. Credit and other, 270 million up from 253 million. And some incentive distributions. And then we have transaction and advisory fees. So the total fee revenues, like we saw before, 1.1 billion here. And then we take out the costs such as comp and benefits and other expenses. And then we get to the FRE or fee related earnings before performance fees at 598 million. So again, that is the breakdown and some great, great performance here by their business units. Again, renewable power and transition was a slight uh, lackluster performance, but we'll look at that when we look at the words from their CEO, Bruce Flatt. All right, so I really like this infographic, you know, stable fee revenue growth and consistent margins. So that's great. Now we're gonna be looking at their fee revenues and the FRE, the fee related earnings, as well as their DE or distributable earnings. So 4.3 billion in the last 12 months of fee revenues. So again, you're adding the last 12 months here and that increased 12% compared to the prior period. So again, revenue is increasing at a nice steady rate, 12% compared to the same prior period last year. And as you can see here, that FRE or fee related earnings margin right here, in this orange color is staying relatively consistent around 56 to 57 percent so that's good good fre margin here in my opinion and again if you want to take a pause and look at these specifics for their renewables or infrastructure private equity real estate credit you're welcome to do that now 2.2 billion in the last 12 months of fee related earnings and that is an increase of 13 percent compared to the prior year period now the lifetime earnings here or sorry, the 2.2 billion in the last 12 months distributable earnings increased 12% for that same prior period, representing a dividend payout ratio of 92% of their DE or distributable earnings in the third quarter. So again, as you can see here, the FRE, that's this fee related earnings in the dark blue right here, it's helming along nicely. And then the DE or the distributable earnings basically growing in line with that as well. And as we can see, it's humming around that 99% to 100% mark there. All right, so we're going to be looking at this letter from Bruce Flatt, their CEO. So he had some nice words to say and some good rationale for their investment thesis and their investment time horizon as well as their expected results. So we're going to look at the overview. So they delivered strong results and their business performed extremely well, demonstrating its resilience and diversification. Private assets continue to show their advantages for investors with stability during these volatile markets. This is contributing to increasing allocations to alternatives. So by contrast, the volatility of equities, as we know, if you've been invested in the stock market, basically at any time over the past three or four years, you've seen volatility. And this these publicly traded fixed income instruments, again, just such as bonds, it's, it's not only been on the stock market, but also in the fixed income or bond market, Prices have gone up and down, up and down over the past couple of years. Very, very volatile. It, those are traditionally considered a safe haven, these bonds. It's left many investors searching for alternative areas of investment. And that's where Brookfield actually shines. So their FRE and their DE, so those distributable earnings and fee-related earnings, were solid. Distributable earnings were $568 million for the period, like we saw. And they continue to project significant growth of their earnings in 2024. So... Unlike other financial institutions or other businesses, Brookfield has kept their foot on the pedal and on the gas. Like he says, they've been very active in the third quarter and the beginning of the fourth quarter with breadth and scale of their franchise, enabling them to complete several large transactions. They are on track to have their largest funding year ever so a fundraising year ever with inflows of 24 billion since their last earnings report which takes capital raised like we saw for this year to date 61 billion and still heading towards that 150 billion dollar mark so the interest rates as he says he believes are peaking and this is good for transaction activity like we know when interest rates are high the economy essentially gets compressed and it's very very hard to have consistent transactions or transactional activity. It's hard. a lot of people go on the defensive here, but Brookfield has, like I said, they've kept their foot on the gas and they're staying on the offensive, keep 
They keep investing, keep buying assets, keep buying businesses, and keep expanding their core businesses using those synergies in their ecosystem. So like he states, central banks have made significant progress in lowering headline inflation. Economic activity has been resilient. Labor markets are tight, particularly in the U.S. This has led to the market expectations expectation that interest rates have created however it is worth noting that rates are still low on an absolute basis by historic standards again he is when you're looking at interest rates over the past 70 80 years they are still relatively low compared to the past timelines so that is good information to know and with this backdrop the market has increased confidence in pricing risk and is bringing back liquidity so people are starting to pour money back into the markets as we've also seen in the stock market. Now, they have record levels of dry powder. Like we saw, they have all of that uncalled for cash or uncalled funds, and it's currently on the sidelines, and they expect to be very, very busy in the near future of 2024, and they will continue going through transactions and conducting their business just like they did in 2023. So geopolitics, again, is often the case. It's unknown and it could lead to heightened volatility in the near term. But they expect that in the fullness of time or over the long term, in other words, this will not impact their long term outlook for the global economy. Very key point here. Again, a lot of geopolitics can weigh on the stock market, specific events in terms of the economy and specific uh, political risks. Those are always there. But again, over the long term, Bruce Latt feels that Brookfield will continue to invest and they will continue to deliver great, great returns. All right, so this is one point that I wanted to look at, this listed perpetual ent uh, entities. Now, if you're familiar with Brookfield and you, you know some of their subsidiaries like Brookfield Infrastructure Partners or Brookfield Renewable Partners, their stock prices have declined significantly, which also has an effect on Brookfield Asset Management because it gets asset management fees for managing the assets of these companies. So let's see what he has to say here. So publicly tr traded utility infrastructure and renewable power sectors, he's talking about in a whole or aggregate, have traded lower recently, in large part due to the perceived effect of interest rates on these securities and some discrete issues impacting certain market participants. So while the Brookfield listed entities were not directly impacted by these issues, they traded down in sympathy. So again, when these stretch these uh, sectors, sorry, such as utilities, infrastructures, renewable power sectors, all of these sectors usually come with companies that operate in these sectors that have large levels of debt. So when the interest rates rise, those valuations come down. Those stock valuations come down because the cost of capital or the cost that it takes to service that debt increases, thereby making these businesses less profitable. And what Bruce Flat is saying here is that their Brookfield uh, subsidiaries and these other businesses of Brookfield, such as Brookfield Infrastructure Partners and, and Renewable Partners, their businesses were not affected intrinsically, but their stock prices fell in sympathy with the other companies in those sectors. So again, in order to align Brookfield's interests, they charge their listed entities, such as BIP and BEP, they charge them management fees based on their market capitalization. So the results this quarter were partially impacted by the share price performance of Brookfield Infrastructure Partners and Brookfield Renewable Partners. So I actually really like this a lot. They're keeping these interests aligned, like he said, and they are not just basically having the management fee based on a different uh, metric. It's based on market capitalization. So they want all of their businesses to succeed. So when these other businesses are not doing as well, they're not paying out as much in management fees because the market capitalization of them has gone down. So that's really, really cool. So BIP and BEP or BIP and BEP both have strong underlying business fundamentals and strong balance sheets with attractive and achievable FFO or funds from operation and distribute, distribution growth targets. Both companies gave strong guidance at their investor days last month and announced robust earnings results last week. Again, I, I don't think I went over these results on my channel, but they, they were great here in my opinion from both BIP and BEP. And they believe that their recent share prices are largely uh, negatively affected because of public uh, market sentiment and their share prices will ultimately rebound.
found. So again, Brookfield, they have a strong five-year organic growth plan. Uh, I did watch their investor day and I did go over some other specifics on my channel. So I would encourage you to go back in and look at those videos. But they have this goal of surpassing $1 trillion in fee-bearing capital or FBC by 2028. This represents about an 18% compound annual growth rate at coming from all of their businesses and particular emphasis on the accelerated growth within the private credit and insurance or reinsurance platforms, which are expected to grow over 500 billion combined. Now, further growth is going to be driven by fundraising efforts across their flagship funds and complementary strategies, and that should propel their FRE or fee related earnings to approximately $5 billion by 2028, almost all of which will still be stable and resilient free uh, fee earnings. Sorry. So again, that is great to hear. They're, they still are on track to continue to grow at 18% per year for the next five years. So we're going to just look at this uh, snippet on the balance sheet here again. And he's saying he's going to be selective. So I like to hear that they're being selective and using their cash or cash equivalents from their balance sheet or their reserves to go into specific selective strategies that will be accretive to their shareholders. So again, if you've been following my channel, as you know, Brookfield Asset Management or BAM is debt free. It is a asset light manager. The debt is held with the corporation and the specific subs. So as he states, their balance sheet is debt free. They currently hold close to $3 billion net of cash and cash equivalents. This fortress balance sheet is a source of strength for their business and they use it selectively and effectively. By doing this, they will drive growth in their asset management activities over and beyond their stated goals. Now, they may utilize their balance sheet to launch new fund strategies and business lines or make strategic acquisitions to bolster their existing capabilities. Now, in closing here, he states, they will remain committed to being a world-class asset, uh, asset manager and strive to invest in capital in high-quality assets that earn solid returns while emphasizing downside protection. The primary objective of the company continues to be to generate increasing, increasing cash flows on a per share basis and to distribute that cash to you by dividend or share repurchases. So again, Brookfield Asset Management, great, great company, solid, solid returns. They're focusing on emphasizing downside protection. So thinking of us as the investor and also increasing these cash flows per share. So cash flows per our equity investment and distributing that cash by a dividend or share repurchases. And again, they pay out 90% of these as dividends. And then they also will buy back some shares if their opportunity presents itself. So that was Brookfield Asset Management's most recent quarterly earnings and the shareholder letter from their CEO, Bruce Flat. Hope you enjoyed the content and I will see you in the next one. Thanks, bye. Please note, I am not a financial advisor by any means. All this content is merely for your entertainment educational purposes only. Please do your own due diligence when investing as investing is inherently risky and you may lose money. Please note, I am not liable for any investing losses or decisions you incur. Thank you.